My name is Don Mercer, and in this video we are going to be looking at the blanching of fruits and vegetables. Financial support for production of this series of video presentations was provided by the Széchenyi Society, founders of the Hungarian programs at the University of Toronto. The Széchenyi Society sponsorship is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Dr. Leventi Diashadi, professional engineer and fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, who is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Diashadi's considerable efforts in coordinating this project are greatly appreciated. The material in these video presentations is based on an ebook published in November of 2014. Its title is An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables. It is available on the International Union of Food Science and Technology website, which can be accessed at www.iufost.org. We will begin by defining what is meant by the term blanching and explain why we blanch food products. For those of you who are unfamiliar with enzymes, we will explain what enzymes really are and how they work. Then we'll move on to enzymatic browning and take a look at a couple of examples of enzymes including catalase and peroxidase. Then we will move on to the blanching of food products. So just what is blanching? Simply stated, blanching is a process in which fruits or vegetables are submerged in boiling water for a given period of time. They are then removed from the boiling water and plunged into or sprayed with cold water to stop the blanching process. The reason we blanch products is to accomplish two main objectives. First, it essentially pasteurizes the surface of the fruits and vegetables and reduces the population of microorganisms that may be growing there. Second, it deactivates enzymes that are naturally present in the fruit or vegetables which can lead to the loss of quality and spoilage. Blanching does not really cook the food. It provides sufficient time at a suitably high temperature to effectively kill the surface microorganisms and deactivate or denature the enzymes that are present. Most fruits and vegetables should be blanched before they are frozen for storage. And many fruits and vegetables should also be blanched prior to drying. So just what is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein molecule that has bioactivity. This means that it is biologically active and can act to speed up chemical reactions that would otherwise go very slowly or perhaps not at all. As biological catalysts, they are specific, meaning that they promote only certain reactions and no others. One particular model used to describe how enzymes behave and function is called the induced fit theory of specificity. This is just a fancy way of comparing an enzyme to a lock and key situation. Enzymes have active sites which promote the desired reactions. Enzymes take a starting material called the substrate and convert it to reaction products. Generally, enzymes are named by taking the name of the substrate material and adding the ending ASE to it. As an example, the enzyme that acts on peroxide is called peroxidase. Consider the enzyme invertase. It acts on the molecule sugar and in the presence of water the invertase converts the sucrose to glucose and fructose. This is the inversion process to convert sucrose to invert sugars. If invertase is placed in a solution of lactose and sucrose, it will only react with the sucrose even though both sugars are disaccharides and have the same molecular weight. And that is because invertase is specific for the molecule sucrose. Let's take a look at how an enzyme works. 
This diagram is used to represent the enzyme molecule. The active sites are indicated by the red asterisks. Then we can bring in this shape, which represents a sucrose molecule. We also need to recognize that the reaction is taking place in the presence of an abundance of water. So we will indicate water molecules with this blue triangle. Sucrose molecules will align with the active sites on the enzyme molecules. So you can see here how the substrate molecule is fitting into the enzyme molecule just as a key would fit into a lock. Water molecules then move into position to hydrolyze the bond between the two monosaccharides that make up the sucrose molecule. The glucose and fructose molecules will then leave the active sites and the enzyme will remain unchanged. Enzymatic reactions are affected by things like the acidity or pH of the solution, the temperature at which the reaction is occurring, and the substrate concentration. Because they are proteins, they can be deactivated in the same way other proteins are denatured. One of the enzymes of primary concern in blanching is polyphenol oxidase. Polyphenol oxidase, or PPO as it is also known, catalyzes the formation of brown or black pigments in fruits and vegetables as they age. This process is referred to as enzymatic browning. Cauliflower is particularly susceptible to enzymatic browning. This fresh cauliflower has nice bright white or cream colored florets, but in the presence of polyphenol oxidase and over time, we get the development of undesirable dark pigments which turn the white or cream colored florets to light brown, then to dark brown, and even to purple or black. And of course, we have to remember that PPO is the abbreviation for polyphenol oxidase. Catalase enzymes catalyze the conversion of peroxides to water and oxygen. Let's take a molecule of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and in the presence of catalase, it will be converted to water and oxygen, given off as gaseous bubbles. Looking at this reaction, we can see that the number of hydrogen atoms on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are balanced. There are two on the left and on the right. However, there are three oxygen atoms on the right and only two on the left. So before we can proceed, we should balance this equation. To do that, we'll take two hydrogen peroxide molecules on the left side and then balance the number of hydrogens up by putting a two in front of the water molecule. Checking here, we see that we have four hydrogen atoms on the left and four on the right. We have four oxygens on the left and we have four on the right, so we can now proceed. Note how two molecules of peroxide are converted to two molecules of water and one molecule of oxygen, which is given off as a gas. Catalase is found in certain meat tissue, but not in plants. However, it is a good example to show how enzymes work. Pouring a weak hydrogen peroxide solution over some beef liver will give us a violent reaction as the oxygen bubbles form. The reaction of catalase and hydrogen peroxide is shown here. Here we have some beef liver which naturally contains catalase enzyme. We'll add some hydrogen peroxide to it and in the next slide we'll see what happens. So here is the reaction that's going to take place. We are now adding a weak solution of hydrogen peroxide and you can see the violent foaming which results. These are actually oxygen bubbles being released by the enzymatic action on the hydrogen peroxide. If we take a sample of the beef liver and submerge it in boiling water for several minutes, we will deactivate the catalase enzyme. This is because the input of heat changes the structure or configuration of the enzyme so that it is no longer biologically active. 
the reaction of heated beef liver and hydrogen peroxide will look like this. Here's the heated piece of beef liver. We add the hydrogen peroxide and what we end up with is absolutely nothing happening. So there is no enzymatic activity to show. Peroxidase enzymes catalyze the conversion of peroxides to water and oxygen in plants. We have hydrogen peroxide in the presence of peroxidase giving us water and oxygen which is liberated as a gas and once again we need to balance this chemical reaction. The question that now arises is why would there be peroxidase enzyme present in plants? Peroxide molecules are formed as byproducts of a plant's metabolic processes such as respiration. If the concentration of peroxide was allowed to build up, it would be harmful to the plant. So the plant produces peroxidase enzymes to consume the peroxide as it is formed. We will now use the peroxidase enzyme as an example to show how blanching works. We can then extend this learning to enzymes present in plants that cause degradation, such as polyphenol oxidase that we saw in the cauliflower. For our example, we will take a slice of raw turnip, cut it into smaller pieces, and place them on a saucer or in a bowl. Then we will pour some hydrogen peroxide solution over these pieces. We will be using 3% peroxide like you can buy at the drugstore. After a short time, you should be able to see oxygen bubbles forming around the edges of the turnip. Here we have some slices of raw turnip to which we will be adding a peroxide solution. Notice the bubbles of oxygen that are being released. We have now shown that there is peroxidase present in the turnip. We did not add any enzymes so the bubbles of oxygen must have been generated by the enzymes within the turnip itself. Now we will see what happens when we blanch a slice of turnip. To do this, we will place a slice of turnip in a heat-resistant container, such as a coffee mug. Then we can pour enough boiling water into the mug to completely cover the turnip slice, and that means we need to fill the mug to about half full. The contents of the mug can be stirred with a fork, and then the water in the mug can be replaced with fresh boiling water after about a minute and a half. After about three minutes, we can pour the water out of the mug and run cold water over the turnip slice to cool it down and stop the blanching process. The slice can then be cut into strips and placed on a clean saucer. We can pour some 3% hydrogen peroxide solution over the blanched turnip and watch to see what happens. When hydrogen peroxide was poured over the blanched turnip, the material simply stayed there and there were no oxygen bubbles liberated so there was no enzymatic activity to show. If the blanching was done properly, the peroxidase enzyme should have been deactivated, which it was, and no bubbles should be observed coming from the edges of the blanched turnip strips. So here we see what happens with the raw turnip, and you can see that there is a considerable amount of bubbling happening around the raw turnip pieces. However, with the blanched turnip, there are no such bubbles. In summary, we can use our experience with peroxidase to show that enzymes can be deactivated by a heat treatment process, which we call blanching. If peroxidase is deactivated by heating, then we would reasonably expect other enzymes to behave in a similar manner. This would indicate that blanching should be effective in deactivating degradative enzymes such as polyphenol oxidase. In conclusion, blanching works. Blanching should be done before drying or freezing any fruits and vegetables where there is a risk of enzymatically induced degradation or spoilage. 
and there may be some additional conclusions that you can make on your own. Thank you very much.